The Dubs are now just half a game ahead of Houston for the fourth and final play-in tournament position as the surging Rockets own the NBA's longest winning streak, while the Warriors have now lost six of their last ten. Entering a difficult-as-hell five-game road trip, the Dubs blew another two double-digit leads against the six-seeded Pacers and number three-seeded Timberwolves. Now leading the NBA for the most blown 12 plus point leads in a must win close game against the top seed. Instead of subbing Steph back in at the 856 mark after a timeout when the Golden State deficit was at just four with plenty of time remaining, Kerr opted to keep Curry on the bench following his timeout. Minnesota then doubled their advantage to eight before Kerr would call another timeout and finally get his best player back into the game, which at that point was with under seven minutes left. This equated to Curry sitting for 30 minutes of real time. Good luck finding a flow after that, as sometimes you question how much Kerr is actually trying to win, something Mike Dunleavy and GMs across the NBA should take note of. What Steve's been thinking with his substitutions all season has been head-scratching for Dub Nation and basketball fans in general, and this will be the coach of Team USA at the Olympics, so these mishaps don't just concern Warrior fans. Golden State would finish minus 11 in the non-Steph minutes, but post-game, Kerr would back up his decision to keep Curry off the court down the stretch, despite the team needing Steph at his best in a must-win game, saying, you can't expect to ride Steph game after game after game. We've put the burden of this franchise on his shoulders for 15 years. Curry would react to Kerr's decision to keep him out until the 654 mark in the fourth quarter of a must-win. Surprised how long he rested in the fourth. Uh, with me, obviously, you're comparing it to the last game and the manure rotation. Like, I want to play as many minutes as, as I'm fresh and able to. Uh, so, a little bit, knowing that they were just going on a run, um, it was the lead was kind of weathering away. This didn't work out, so we got to find somewhere in the middle. I mean, can you only play 30 to 32 right now, considering what's at stake? The uh, situation will define itself pretty clearly, and it is in, in kind of real time. So every game matters. You know, we're inching closer to the other end of the standings that we never thought we'd be in. So nobody's going to wave the white flag and say, you know, you're, you're mailing it in. And if that means playing more minutes, and I'll be ready to do that. A fan would respond to that last statement from Wardell by tweeting, Man, if you don't start checking yourself into games like LeBron does, I'm done. That may have been a half-serious jab, but Steph controlling his own playing time is legitimately the only way the Warriors aren't cooked. It's time for Steph to start being more confrontational, in terms of telling Kerr that from here on out, he's going to be checking himself in and out of games given the seasons on the line. This is not an unrealistic scenario by any means given the circumstances, combined with all that Curry's accomplished and therefore deserves. Curry sitting down for such extended stretches and having to regain a rhythm while shaking off rust is 10 times worse for him mentally and physically than, say, playing 37 to 40 minutes per game. In my opinion, he should be playing 40 plus minutes per game, but whether or not he's in shape for that is a question mark after being on an unnecessary minutes restriction that's hampered his rhythm all season. Kerr's been cautious for a decade with Steph's minutes. With a 36-year-old Stefan, who now doesn't have many chances left at a fifth title, it's become utterly crucial that Kerr gives the man who turned this organization from a small market team into the league's most expensive franchise the leeway to decide when he checks in and out of games over these final 12 outings. Steve has to realize that possibly one of Stefan's final years as a pro basketball player is in jeopardy, with Houston not having any problems and having put themselves right on the dub's tail. I don't give a damn about the Rockets. In addition to not giving a damn about Houston, Draymond Green gave his take on why what the Warriors haven't been able to take advantage of could come back to bite them. In this league, you have to win the games you're supposed to win and, and still a few that you're not supposed to win. But if you lose the ones you're supposed to win, you're in for a long year. Green would also provide insight on a fraction of what's gone wrong for Golden State. But in order to win, you have to build good habits. I don't think we have great habits. Until you play with great habits at all times, you lose. You just can't win having breakdowns. If you have breakdowns, it changes momentum. And momentum in this league is not hard to, I mean, it's not easy to get back. They're an NBA team too. And by the standings, they're a much better NBA team than us. So if you can't not have breakdowns, you're going to lose. And if you play against a team that is technically better than you and you have breakdowns, you're always going to lose. And that's why we lose a lot right now. 
seemed like in the second half it was mostly like half court like you know pick and roll or switch type breakdowns yeah. uh we're a very quiet team so you have communication you have you have issues on defense when you have back communication Two most obvious issues in the two most recent L's stemmed from the coaching staff who firstly, as mentioned, sat Curry a shockingly long amount of time in a must win, and secondly, played out of date for the evolving tall ball era, small ball lineups that got exposed. The latter being small ball lineups getting exposed will come to light in this film room as let's sort through a few of the breakdowns Draymond was potentially alluding to against Indiana and Minnesota. Pajemski runs Halliburton off the three point line and could do a better job of pressuring Halley while defending from behind instead of swiping to no avail. But the real breakdown here is the lack of help defense from Kaminga, who's just standing there instead of rotating. What should happen here is Brandon funnels Tyrese into Kaminga, who switches, then Brandon rotates onto Kaminga's man in Siakam. That doesn't even come close to happening. Brandon's swipe is all that he does and he just watches a pacer bucket. The kid has to make another rotation and communicate better. While he is a rookie, if he's going to be starting, he has to be held accountable. Here we have Kaminga jogging back and we don't see him enter the frame until Nemhard has entered a jump which collapses the defense before he finds Siakam. Kaminga could have made an impact but didn't hustle back. This right here is ill-advised help defense from Curry and a low IQ play as this Siakam take and Turner back screen is already sandwiched by three warrior defenders. All Steph has to do is stay solid but bad defensive habits that he's built up from game plans consisting of sagging off three point shooters lead Curry to stunt off Neesmith allowing him to cleanly catch and release, there was no need for help right there by any means. Wiggins barely makes an effort on this Siakam attack, where Pascal takes Andrew to school by transitioning to the post, bodying him off, and this closeout from Andrew is pathetic. There is then zero communication in transition. You have to talk to one another. That quietness, in addition to Kerr's small ball unit, leaves the six foot Paul on the 6'8 Siakam, allowing for an easy pacer bucket. More issues in transition cost the dubs right before half, as instead of Curry running back to pick up Halliburton, he traps Siakam for whatever reason, who's going to have a clear passing lane to Tyrese regardless. Clay tries to make up for that by closing out, but that initial Steph mishap gives Halliburton time to let loose and drain the buzzer beater. Pojemski and Green failed to hustle back on this pacer fast break, and this is terrible backside help and rebounding communication from Wiggins, Kaminga, and Curry. Here we see a few more joggers through the park and Kaminga and Curry not getting back with any type of desperateness, costing Golden State when Siakam grabs his own miss and puts it back. Knowing the Warriors don't hustle back, Siakam's just going to instantly outlet to Tyrese. Decent chase down attempt, but this not getting back thing has to be a habit that's 360 if the Dubs have any chance. Switching pick and rolls when you're playing without one traditional big has stopped working for Kerr. As here, GP2 is forced to switch onto Siakam. Clay helps, but is also too small, and it's Pascal with the bucket. That same issue of not playing a second traditional big gets exposed when Neesmith drives and drops it off to Pascal, who's picked up by Clay, but Thompson already proved on the last play we looked at to be no match for a 6'8 dude who's all muscle. Watch how easy the dubs get beat up the floor after Trace fails to snag the O board. As like Draymond said, this is a quiet team, no one's talking to each other, evidently Kerr's game plan and points of emphasis haven't been shifted intently enough, and it's a Neesmith leak out. After a four hour flight to Minneapolis, Pojemski loses track of Conley twice in one cut to the basket. The first time Kaminga provides help and the Warriors get away with it, but the second time Pods loses track of Conley on one cut without communicating, it forces the help of Green, which opens up a passing lane for Mike to find Reed in the corner. Curry rotates over there well, but Nas can shoot over the top of Steph much easier than the force to help at the rim Draymond. Pojemski's defensive wherewithal to know where his matchup is in the half court has to be night and day better than that. Showing us why Kerr's three guard lineups drive Dub Nation insane, Trace is matched up with Kyle Anderson, allowing Reed to slip to the basket where instead of being met with the help of a bulky forward either up front or on the wing, Nas has a post up on the much shorter Pojemski and it's an easy post hook for Reed. The transition meltdowns carried over from the Pacer matchup as on this fast break, Alexander Walker spots Nas Reed and Kaminga fails to cut off the center position's second most efficient three point shooter from doing what he does best. The coaching staff has to better preach the scouting report, but Kaminga himself has to be much more aware of Reed's three-point shooting eliteness than this. You not only have to press up on Nas, but you have to force him to put it on the deck. 
You can't have turnovers like this one from Steph, but it's how Curry gets upset with himself after the giveaway while cutting off Kaminga instead of hustling back on defense that makes Ant-Man navigating the interior much easier as he bodies off Wiggins before floating it over him. I know he's 36, but with his experience, Steph should know to focus on the next play and get back. Gobert sets an on-ball screen for Conley, while at the same time, Reed sets a flare screen for Edwards, which exposes brutal screen communication from Wiggins and Kaminga, as they leave Reed wide open for a clean catch and shoot. Where is the team-oriented communication to say, pick him up? Where I got him. That last play says it all with the dubs this season right there. You have to want to play for each other in order to win, which is the biggest thing the Warriors aren't doing right now and haven't done throughout massive portions of the season, refusing to lay it on the line to make the extra rotation, not talking to one another, and from a coaching standpoint, a supreme lack of in-game adjustments, unique locker room motivation, down the stretch play calling, in addition to poor scouting reports and preaching of said scouting reports, are all responsible for the Warriors recent recent demise. As much as I've been hyped about the receipts I have from TNT's finest about writing off the Warriors all year, unfortunately it seems like Chuck may have been Flash right back. all along. The Warriors are cooked. <laughs> All that matters to me though is your opinion. Why or why not are the Warriors cooked? Best answer gets next video's commenter shout out while competing to be one of five to win either a free jersey or shoe of their choosing. Today's commenter shout out goes to a former giveaway winner, Irvin Guerra, who says the Boston Celtics offense has been the most unreal part about their season so far. With their new major additions of Porzingis and Holiday, I expected them to have a bit of a slump early in the season, but right out of the gates they became the number one team by a mile while seamlessly fitting all the pieces together and proving me wrong. Well said, Urban. Appreciate every answer. Thank you for watching. This was your boy, D-Flow, and I'll see you next video.